Canes fans, I got to tell you about our great new sponsor. Listen, we all love placing a bet here and there, right? But is there anything sweeter than winning a bet when it's against your friends? Against the people you know you get one up on them? Man, and, and the thing about it is you can bet with your friends on anything. You can bet with them on the Oscars, on sports, whatever it is. And that's what our new sponsor allows you to do. Let me tell you about Cut. That's K-U-T-T, Cut. The Cut app is a peer-to-peer social betting platform. It's legal in 40-plus states. Cut has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards. All payments, no need for Venmo or anything like that. Listen, you can bet on anything on Cut. You want to bet your friend that the two of you are going to have a 40-yard... Wait a minute. That's not something I would ever do. But you can do it on Cut. That's right. Listen, log on to Cut right now and use our promo code Believe Miami. That's B-L-E-A-V Miami for a 10% welcome deposit bonus. Don't forget that promo code. It's Believe Miami. B-L-E-A-V Miami. Miami. Do it now. Get on there. Get on to cut and bet your friends about anything. It's a blast. What's up, everyone? And welcome to the Real Ones Canes podcast. He is Brandon O'Doy. Follow him on all the socials at Brandon underscore O'Doy. I'm the Beast Brian London. Follow me at Miami Radio Beast. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you get the podcast. Amazon, Apple, Spotify, all those places. And a big props to our, uh, our great sponsor from Cut. Check out Cut. Use code Believe Miami. You can you can bet your friends on whatever you want: chicken wing eating, hot dog eating, running a forty, whatever you want. You can do it all on Cut. So go check it out. Uh, Brandon, another week of spring practice ongoing at the University of Miami. Some storylines to get into, um, and you know one of the juicier ones has been um, at wide receiver. Uh, because the the press got a chance to talk to Jacoby George uh, the other day. And he's a guy, a young man, a lot of talent, um, obviously, and admittedly committed some some boneheaded mistakes last year with some some personal foul plays towards the end of the season. Um, but he seems like he, he gets the, the point, gets the picture. Um, and when talking to Mario about it, Mario said, listen, we thought about leaving him off this roster, but, you know, Kevin Beard got in his ear. Kevin Beard has uh, mentored him, him a little bit to get his head on straight. It seems like he he gets it now. He understands, you know, what what can be ahead of him if he keeps it locked in. Yeah, Jacoby George is one of those guys who kind of reminds you of, like, the former uh, Miami Hurricane, you know, great receivers, guys who were just as dangerous on the field as they were off the field and, and some of the things that they did and, at the end of the day, he's a good kid, but he he has an edge to him, and you like that, and you especially when you see him, you know, playing against Florida State, making the plays that he made in that game at Texas A and M, and kind of busting that game wide open. But he does have an element uh, of explosiveness to his character, and uh, that's something that kind of has to be harnessed. And I know uh, that Kevin Beard feels, you know, very strongly about this young man. After all, they graduated from the same high school. Uh, But Beard let him know very early in his tenure at Miami, just because you're at the University of Miami and just because you're a plantation colonel and and we have, you know, very similar upbringings and we're from the same area doesn't mean that's going to curry any favor with me. And I just know Kevin Beard has been mentoring this young man on and off the field, you know, since he showed up in Coral Gables back at his alma mater. And it doesn't surprise me at all that he went to Mario Cristobal and said, hey, listen, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, there were some silly personal fouls. Uh, but did it cost Miami Hurricanes games? Eh, it's debatable. You know, they were regrettable plays, but he made more positive plays than he did negative. And the, the, the real thing that probably Coach Kevin Beard would like to say to his head coach is, if you get rid of Jacoby George, who can we rely on that we know is actually played football? Because outside of Xavier Restrepo, who, let's face it, has had you know a really, really good uh, past season and a half or so uh, and been injury-free. But when he first came to Coral Gables, uh, he was always riddled with injuries. And he's a guy that has been 
uh, unable to stay on the field in the past. And so if anything happens to X, you don't have a veteran receiver that you can count on with anything close to uh, returnable numbers or production in college football. You got a lot of people who are flashing, including, you know, Isaiah Horton, who played sparingly last year. You know, Ray Ray uh, looks really good, you know, in his second year, but he didn't play a whole lot, didn't produce an entire lot. You got a lot of freshmen that you love to like in Josiah Trader and Nye Carr, and they're lighting up practices. And I even hear good things about your best friend, Elijah Arroyo, and, uh, (laughs) you know, the young man from Bishop Gorman playing tight end. But at the end of the day, you need veterans. You need guys you can depend on. You need guys with stats. You need guys, you know, who have, you know, been there and done that. And that's what Jacoby George brings in. That's probably why he's getting patience because, it really makes no sense to get rid of a guy who's only done some annoying things, not so much egregious things. We'll get to the tight ends in a moment. I know it's my favorite topic, so you know we have to to get it in there. But <laughs> let's talk about Isaiah Horton because, you know, just in, in hearing every player talk throughout the spring, they've talked about Isaiah Horton really taking that step forward. And again, you point to Kevin Beard being that position coach, a guy that can really get these guys to make the most out of their time and, and, and get better. Um, and I think Isaiah Horton's one of these guys that I think we're going to see uh, have a real impact this upcoming year. Well, absolutely. He comes in, the guy is six plus six, two plus maybe six, three. He can run. He was recruited by Alabama, Ohio state, and some of the big name programs coming out of Nashville, Tennessee. And so he's a guy I'm pretty familiar with. He played in my middle school, all American game in eighth grade. And he was on the same roster as Wesley Besant, who's starting at the linebacker position at the University of Miami. He proved even then in eighth grade that he could keep up with South Florida talent. The question has been, how much does he actually love the game of football? And so when you're looking at a guy that's coming in with those tools and all of those things, it just took time for him to understand what was being expected out of him and to gain the trust that he needed to. And everybody just agreed. He just needed to grind harder. He just needed to work harder. You can see it in his body. Took a picture with him after the spring practice uh, last week, and he was just a completely different dude. He looked chiseled. You know, he always had natural tools. He always could catch. He always had playmaking ability. But I think when you add that to the heart and the work ethic and the go-get-it nature that you need to be an elite college football athlete, that's why you're hearing so much positive momentum around you know, Isaiah Horton, and it couldn't come at a better time because on my college tour, Beast, I ran into another young man that we're familiar with who was a pretty big target here at the University of Miami. He goes by the name of Kobe Young, and he's wearing, you know, the red and the black, and he looked really comfortable inside the facility at the University of Georgia, and you just have to wonder what in the world would life have been like had he come back, Isaiah Horton still here, Xavier Restrepo, and Jacoby George, and add to that mixture, Cam Ward. So one could only hope and dream, but for now, Young's out and Horton's in, and we needed him to step up, and it sounds like he's doing that. I want to talk about your college tour in a second, uh, in a little bit, but can we just, for real quick, I want to give props to Kevin Beard. He's a dude I've known for a long time since he came in as a freshman at the University of Miami. I know you've known K Beard for a long time as well. Uh, he, he's just an unbelievable coach, a great dude, um, but he's a great mentor. He was like that even as a player. Um, and he, he's not, he's not Mr. Tom Foolery out there. He, he takes this game seriously. And I think he instills that in these guys as well. I agree. I mean, he's a guy that's center. He knows who he is and he knows who he's not. He's a family guy. He's a man of the cloth, similar to myself. At the end of the day, he has a great mixture of maturism, maturation, but also uh, the ability to relate to young kids and and has his ear to the street, so to speak, and is relatable in his communication with these young guys. And then the thing that always helps is, hey, man, I've done it at a high level. Like, I'm in this same locker room. I was on this same practice field. Like, I'm not asking you to do anything that I didn't first do myself. So if I don't know the keys to, you know, the kingdom, if I can't show you the way, who can? And so at the end of the day, you know, that's what separates KB from a lot of these receiver coaches. It's like I was a productive, you know, wide receiver on one of the best teams that ever played college football. So that needs to be, you know, really parked in the back of the minds of these young men that he's coaching. And I think, you know, after enough time goes by and they talk to enough people, 
and enough guy come in and say, hey, man, I can't believe you're getting coached up by, you know, Kevin Beard. You know, this is a guy that, you know, on a team full of legends, you know, he stood out. So um, at, at the end of the day, I think that's what you want to do at the University of Miami. You want to have guys that can take the talent you're getting and recruiting because everything that shows up in the recruiting game doesn't show up ready to play. It's got to be developed. And that's what you want. You want recruiting, you want development, and you want coaching in game and on the field and the practice fields at Green Tree. And, and if you get a triple threat type of coach, that's a guy that you want to elevate. That's the guy you want to keep around. And that's the guy you want to continue to invest in because it's going to make your team better. Even when unforeseen things happen, like the departure of a Kobe Young. And so you need Isaiah Horton to be brought along. You need Jacoby George to be more focused. You need some of these freshmen to step up, and you need a Kevin Beard to make that happen. Yeah, and uh, speaking of stepping up, you need the tight end position to step up. Um, you know, listen, I, I think Elijah Arroyo, like, I, I think he could be something, whether he is or not, we'll see. But they got... Elijah Lofton, the kid out of Bishop Gorman in, in Las Vegas, one of the, the best schools out there. Uh, Riley Williams coming into his second year. And so I was looking for clues. Like, how do I, like, I've heard the tight ends are stepping up, doing better, but like, why is that? And I keep coming back to this and what I'm hearing from, from the other kids, especially from the defensive guys, the linebackers that are guarding these tight ends. Cam Ward throws the ball where it's supposed to be thrown in a tight window. It's a tight throw and he's getting the ball where it needs to be. He's looking for the right reads, and that's why the position group is doing better because the quarterback is better That's getting them the football. And it makes sense. Well, that's a little bit of low-hanging fruit talking about the quarterback's better. I'm not going to bash Tyler Van Dyke any more than I already have on this podcast. But at the end of the day, you know, if you improve in certain areas, this team last year was one of the best teams on paper outside of a few positions. And one of those was the quarterback position, which just happens to be the most important position on the football field. And so at the end of the day, Beast, if you go down there uh, to Coral Gables and you get involved in that indoor practice facility and you go out to Green Tree practice field and you talk to enough people who've been around for the, the majority of this spring practice, you're going to hear people gushing over Cam Ward and what he brings to this hurricane offense. And so, yes, he's going to upgrade every single position out there. And see, the position we don't even really know about uh, that's going to benefit from this is the running back position because yeah. teams aren't going to be able to load up and, and do, you know, just key on the running. Like Tyler Van Dyke was not running the football. You don't know what Cam Ward's going to do. And you don't even know what Reese P is going to do. So if for some reason he goes down, you got a guy that mimics him. Uh, and I even think to the extent of a Ja'Curry Brown, uh, who, who's lower on the depth chart, like all, there, there's alignment in the play styles of these quarterbacks. And it gives Miami a playmaking factor that we just really haven't seen in a very long time at that position, if ever. And so at the end of the day, um, you're going to start seeing people, you know, do things that you didn't think were possible. And I think it's going to make everybody better. But more importantly, this tight end position that has been sort of a forgotten about position can be an X factor with Lofton. He's a guy that I liked out of Bishop Gorman in high school. He absolutely lit up Miami Central when they went out. He was the reason they won the game. He rushed for a score. He caught a score. I think he even threw for a score. It's ridiculous all the ways that they used him offensively. He's a you know a little bit of a diminutive tight end, but we know he's an H back around 6'6", six, 6'1", six, maybe 6'2". This is a guy that has speed. He has agility, quickness. He can catch the ball, but more importantly, he can make plays. And that's why Shannon Dawson has to find ways to involve him. And I think what you're going to see him do is be the guy that replaces Brashard Smith in this offense and maybe have a little bit more flexibility uh, because of the fact that he can line up in some places where you kind of have to respect what he does. Yeah, that, that, that guy that you could move around, put in different positions and use to kind of keep the defense on edge uh, certainly is, is something that is uh, that this offense definitely needs, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, they talked about uh, the big word this so far this spring is cross-train. And what they mean by cross-train is guys are, are kind of working at different positions, right? Like Mario didn't say this was going to happen, but he's like, I could throw Elijah Lofton at linebacker right now and he could play a bunch of minutes for us. like. 
but they're doing it along the offensive line. They're doing it with the linebackers. Guys are playing Mike. Guys are playing Will. They're being moved around. Everyone's being moved around, right? Um, and it's that kind of versatility they want from players to give them different options, different looks that they can throw at an offense and a defense to keep other teams kind of on their feet as far as preparation goes. Yeah, I don't know how if I'm going to buy that spin uh, coming from uh, Coach Kristen Paul, but at the end of the Come day, on. if you if you got guys that you like at positions, you're not experimenting with them at other places. I will say I have heard that on the defensive line, Jason Taylor and Joseph I want guys who can play inside and outside, and I think that's fair to say, and they've always cross-trained every offensive line worth their salt does that because you never know who's going to go down at any time. But I will say that, you know, we're still waiting for the portal window to open up and kind of solidify what's going on on the back end with regard, you know, to this defensive backfield because either they are really, really in trouble or these wide receivers are going to be all world. So I don't know which one it is, um, but we have to wait and find out. Yeah, I got nothing for you on the back end there. We're gonna—I think we might have to wait till the portal uh, opens before we have some more some news on that position getting better. I want to talk about linebacker real quick because um, Kiko came back this week from his injury, so that's good to see. He's really become the leader on that defense. Um, he's uh, you know really taking over that Cam Kitchens role as the bona fide leader of the defense, um, and. You know, the guy that's playing next to Wesley Besaint has, has shown out. But another guy that everyone's been talking about, and I heard a little bit at the end of last year about Raul Aguirre Jr., a.k.a. Popo, uh, really coming on. And he's just a, a great young man, well-spoken, really intelligent. You can tell he's he's really getting into the playbook, really studying it, studying the position, wants to learn everything like a sponge. Um, I know he's, you know, he's out of Georgia, uh, but he grew up actually in South Florida, played on, you know, Optimus South Miami until he was about 10 years old. So he's got, he's a South Floridian native. His dad's Cuban actually, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how he develops and if he can really be a playmaker and get into the mix with, with Wesley and uh, with Kiko. Yeah, no, uh, right. Uh, God, uh, I get it. I can't even really pronounce his name. I call him Popo. Um, you know, he is a Miami native and um, he comes from an Afro-Cuban background. At the end of the day, he's a guy that's super tough, very intelligent, as you say. And and I used to talk to his dad all the time, especially when he was growing up. I met him uh, when he was 10 years old. He can he comes from uh, Henry County in Georgia, a little bit south of where I grew up from. Uh, he played for the uh, Henry County Tigers. And so he came down during his youth football days and played a couple of all-star games or like exhibition games against South Florida talent guys like Josiah Trader. He's played them before uh, when he was a youth football kid. So at the end of the day, he's someone who's not afraid of competition. He told me he came and visited me uh, at my seven on seven tournament in, in February. And cause his brother was down from Atlanta playing yeah. and we got a chance to kind of talk offline. And uh, he played in every game last year, on the special team. So he's a guy that brings a, a tremendous amount of experience. He's been in uniform. He's been counted on to run out there. Uh, he and other guys like Malik Curtis at the linebacker position. But I think he's going to be the first guy off the bench because he's absolutely massive as, as a kid. You know, it's just seeing this guy grow up from 10 years old to seeing him at probably 20, 21, whatever he is, um, he's huge. And so He's got intelligence. He's got leadership ability. He knows who he is. He's got those Miami roots. And, uh, you know, I think Canes fans are really going to like, you know, getting to know Popo. And most people know he is a Miami native that was well uh, covered during his recruiting process. But he's a guy that feels, you know, some sense of pride in this university because, you know, he grew up idolizing it just like all the other kids that grow up in Miami. And going to Atlanta is, you know this, from Georgia Tech games and covering those over the years, that's Miami North. And so there yeah. are a lot of Miami fans, a lot of Hurricane fans there, and that probably continued. But, you know, you do need depth at the position. Kiko is is so much a leader. And had it. I thought he had an All-American season last year. I was very surprised when he was left off of some of those teams. He seemed to be everywhere on this defense. And, uh, you know, it's great to see his leadership. But there are some youth – that are coming along, and we knew that they were going to need time to develop behind Wesley Besaint and Kiko. 
Maya Goa. And, and it looks like the time is now uh, for guys like, uh, you know, Raul. And, and we'll see what the future brings. But I'm excited about his play and, and some of his, you know, position mates who were in his, his class uh, because they were a highly touted linebacker hall uh, in the class of 2023. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, D Nick is being uh, D Nick and he's developing uh, these guys. He got a promotion. So it sounds like everybody is pleased with what he's bringing to the table in this Lance Gidry defense for the Miami Hurricanes. Yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me if they went into the portal and got a veteran linebacker too, just to, to supplement uh, numbers there. Um, it'd be interesting. To see. The portal, it's going to be another interesting portal window. We'll definitely have to see that. Hey, well, Brandon, you... don't forget what okay. I said a few pods ago. Don't forget what I said a few pods ago. I said, I think you got to go find the guy to replace Corey. I think you got to find the guy that's the run stopping dude uh, that will come in on those positions, uh, on those situations. And, you know, when Miami is actually traditionally taking and carrying three linebackers. And so if that's a guy you go get in the portal, you do that. You know, KJ Cloud came over from Cincinnati with D Nick. He barely played. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know if there's a veteran needed, but there's definitely a scheme fit that's needed. I think there are two guys that if you take out of this defense, you're going to have problems. Corey's one. And then I'm looking at to Corey couch. I mean, I think he was quietly one of the more important pieces of this defense and he is not easily replaced. So I want to know who's replacing first to Corey and who's placing Corey. And he's playing with his brother at Missouri. We wish him well. He did a great job while he was here. That is what we will see what will happen with the uh, portal opening in a little bit. Hey, you, uh, you do this every year. You do this a lot, which is taking uh, kids around, go see some colleges for your football hotbed, uh, hotbed situation. Um, I saw your pictures on, on, uh, on on socials and uh you guys got to see some great great places uh meet some great people just talk about your tour and what what your kids were able to learn well we had a lot of prospects we started the tour down at university of miami then we went over to fau uh made our way to usf florida florida state uh, Bama, then uh, went to Georgia, Georgia State, and came back to UCF on our way home. And the biggest thing I learned, Beast, is that the size of these kids in these programs is just tremendous. I mean, there are big kids out there. Uh, and one thing I, I can appreciate with what Manny Diaz was doing as he was leaving and what Mario Cristobal has done is get the bodies you need. There were many times, especially during the years where we were dealing with Nevin Shapiro sanctions, where we were marching out teams that were not as big as the competition. And so uh, it's good to see guys at positions who are six foot plus, you know, looking the part. And the other thing I learned is that, you know, these staffs are big. They're committed to winning. They're committed to evaluating talent. You know, they're asking me for guys that I used to have in the football hotbed in, in the portal and, and there are a lot of things that are sort of going on behind the scenes at these colleges and universities. And I'm always humbled by the privilege of being able to go in and out of these universities and learn and see what I see. And that's why a lot of the comments that I make be, may strike listeners as odd or why would he put it that way or say that? It's because I'm getting a look behind the door of what these other programs have. Miami is still losing big time in the facilities race. Florida's facilities are world-class. Bama's facilities are world-class. Georgia's facilities are world-class. And that's the SEC. I and mean, I'm telling you, you know, there's a major difference. FSU is in the middle of a major build for a football-only facility. We could, there was, you know, everywhere you look, there was a caterpillar running around. And, uh, you know, they said it'll be ready for 25. But, you know, there's no ground being broken at the University of Miami. There's no... Um, you know, I know that there's, you know, talk of a building coming in or whatever, but we're in the NIL facilities, major, you know, conference type of place. And we got a few disadvantages being that we're in the ACC that's fledgling right now. They're not a part of the Big Ten or the SEC getting the big money. If those teams for any length of time, and I mean two, three, four years, get deals that the ACC doesn't get. This arms race is just going to get out of control and we're going to be so far behind and it really won't matter, you know, what's going on on the field because it'll just be a it'll just be a matter of time. 
And it's exactly what the SEC did under Saban in the early 10s, the early 2010s, uh, just separating, you know, just putting up massive buildings, creating great facilities, adding staffers, you know, just coaching up every detail. You've got a QC, an analyst. You've got a GA. You've got the position coach. You've got the assistant position coach all for one position. Like you guys are only coaching edges. You're only coaching defensive end. That's four guys being coached up by six. They're more coaches than kids. It's crazy. But this is the area that we live in. And so got a chance to see a lot. It was at the University of Florida. I'll keep my comments to myself. But, you know, it was thick there, so to speak, because they know. So that'll be an interesting place to return to this fall. And that's going to be a super, super important game for this University of Miami team. And let's look, the pressure's on Gainesville, but I'm not going to lie, the pressure's on Miami too. Because if they don't win that game, uh, you're going to start hearing some calls. Uh, on, the other mean, hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, Miami, uh, if, if Miami uh, wins that game, then there's going to be some uh, angry fans and some angry boosters up in Gainesville. As well, that's a that's a huge game. Yeah, for both teams. no, I think I think the writing's on the wall. Uh, that's a that's a big game. That's a big yeah. first game. Yeah, so. for sure, for sure. The All right, side, well, you, you know, I'm always it always motivates me. It inspires me when I see you with with these kids, getting them the opportunity to to get out there and see these campuses and all that stuff. That that stuff really inspires me. The work with you do with these kids is uh is really um to be commended. So. Um, thanks for that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always good to see that. So, um, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. And on the other side, we got to talk about some hoops. There's some big news in the university of Miami basketball program. There's players going out. There's a player coming in. Um, and we're going to do that with our good friend, Liam Willerup. He will join us on the other side. Brandon's going to go take care of his kids because his wife's out of town and he's playing daddy daycare. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to get Liam to come in and talk hoops with me while Brandon goes to try to figure out what's going on at the homestead. So we will do that. Brandon, it's good to see you, my friend. We'll talk to you next week. And for all the rest of you, subscribe to the podcast. Stay tuned. We'll be back on the other side, talking Canes hoops with Liam Willerup. Back after this on the Real Ones Canes podcast. Welcome back to the Real Ones Canes podcast. I am the Beast, Brian London. Follow me on all the socials at Miami Radio Beast. And go subscribe to the podcast wherever you get the podcast at uh, Amazon, Apple, Spotify, all those places. Now, the man, if you're watching this, the man uh, to my left is is not Brandon O'Doy. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, just in case you were confused, if you're listening to this, that laugh you just heard is not Brandon O'Doy. It is Liam Willerup uh, from All Hurricanes. Uh, does a great job of covering all things Miami Hurricanes. And, uh, you know, he's a senior at the U, so we'll see what big things are in store for him. Uh, he's coming to you from Southern California. I'm actually coming to you from Massachusetts. I'm up here uh, with my family. Liam's out in California with his family. So we're just faking it. Like, we, we are right in Miami right now, but we're not. Neither of us are. It's okay. It's fine. You can follow Liam at the Lefty Liam, and you need to follow him because he's got all the latest info on what's going on with the Miami Hurricanes basketball program. Liam, we've got news. We've got all sorts of news. Uh, and let's let's get right to it. Nigel Pack coming back. Yeah, it's it's been a whirlwind of news. Uh, a huge domino in this process. Uh, I was tweeting all about this stuff this morning. Uh, you know, getting a senior guard back for his fifth season is a huge thing in college basketball. If you look at every team that's in the Sweet 16, there's only one that you could argue doesn't have a like a dominant or like kind of an impactful senior or junior like upperclassman guard and that's san diego state otherwise you got talented older guards on every roster whether it's tyler kolick at marquette rj davis at unc caleb love at arizona uh joseph garrard at clemson you know you name it there's impactful older guards that are making winning basketball teams in college basketball and bringing back nigel pack while he wasn't what he was you know, last season in his first season in Miami, injuries derailed him this past season. And be able to come back, spend this offseason on, hey, I'm going to 
you know, focus on being healthy. You know, I got a new addition coming alongside me, a youthful guy in Jaleel Bethea who, you know, he can go do all the trick stuff. I'll be kind of the veteran leader to sit back, you know, focus on playmaking and doing what he does best in shooting the ball. It's extremely big and also really impacts, you know, potentially Oda Ochad O'Meara's return who, you know, came into the process together. They're great friends. And from what my sources have told me, you know, his him coming back is making a big, you know, tidal wave for having Norchad O'Meara to want to return to Miami. We will get to Norchad in a second. I think Nigel coming back is huge. It's big for the program. I love when guys, um, for a long time, in, in basketball, in football, in, in baseball, in a lot of the UM programs, we've seen guys leave before they were really ready to take it to the next level. So for when guys stay and um, not only improve their game, but also provide leadership, I really love that. Um, speaking of a guy that may provide some leadership and also some help at a big-time position, uh, we, we talked, we've talked about Miami needing a big man, and they got one uh, through the portal, and that would be uh, Lynn Kidd. He comes in with a year of eligibility left. He's actually originally from Gainesville, originally went to Clemson. I think he was originally recruited a little bit by Miami out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, went to Clemson, then he transferred to Virginia Tech. He didn't start there, but he played a ton of minutes, like 23 minutes a game. He's a big dude. He can score inside. Uh, what do we know about Lynn Kidd? Yeah, so kind of did everything I could in these last couple of hours to watch as much as I could about him. You know, we saw rumors about this. Uh, was talking with a writer over, uh, worked on the Hokies. He put a crystal ball in for him basically right as he jumped in the portal, which kind of kind of got this buzz going last night. And then, you know, this morning, you know, later in the afternoon over Miami, you know, he decides to make his commitment. So from what I see from him, this dude is a post-scoring maestro. You know, he is not the defensive threat, which I would have liked to have on this team. But uh, he's a guy that can, you know, you throw in the ball in the post. He's got great footwork. He's got a little bit of finesse. He's got a little bit of power. Uh, he's got good touch. He was fourth in the nation in field goal percentage, which is better than, you know, the likely Naismith player of the year, Zach Eady. Led the conference in PER, player efficiency rating. Uh, dishes the ball well for his size. Uh, runs the floor well. Uh, good free throw shooter. So despite not really having an outside game outside of the painted area, uh, he, you know, at least indications are if you've got a good free throw, you might be able to stretch it out on the floor. So those are just some of my quick takeaways from this guy. And I think, you know, whether he gets paired with Omir, that's going to be something interesting to follow along in the storylines. But uh, definitely a position in need. All right. So, look, a lot of pros. And being able to get the ball in the bucket inside important for the Miami Hurricanes. But I can already sense fans frustration when we talk about his – um, issues on the defensive end, not being a great rim protector. That's one. Two, not really having a lot of uh, variety in his game offensively. He's really an inside presence. He doesn't have the ability to to, to be an outside shooter, mid-range shooter, not yet. Um, he seems like a guy with a year of eligibility left that really kind of needed a change of scenery to see if he can get some some aspects of his game going that he wasn't able to do in Blacksburg. Yeah, I mean, you look at the guys like, you know, Quentin Post, P.J. Hall, who really kind of broke out in their final years of college. And, you know, this dude has improved every single year he's been in college basketball. You know, obviously didn't do much at all his first year at Clemson, came over to Virginia, didn't do much that first year, started to creep into the rotation his third, uh, second year at Virginia Tech. And then now look where he is now, you know, was, uh, you know, once he entered the portal, was a top 20 guy already off the board. Uh, you know, you got to hope that at least if he's progressing every single season that he was there, he goes to a new coaching staff that's probably going to be able to provide him new insights, things like that, that hopefully it's going to improve his game. You know, not saying that he's going to go out there and going to be shooting three-pointers and things like that, but, you know, if he can get maybe in a mid-range jump shot, I think that's super important for the spacing-wise because looks like Miami might be going a different direction in terms of this kind of small ball era that they've done or, you know, even the era that it's been with Sam Wardenberg, who's a stretch four or five. Uh, you know, kind of getting a more traditional big. Uh, it's interesting to follow along to. And like you said, you know, isn't like a physically imposing guy, you know, doesn't rebound the ball as well as a guy like Omir does, who, you know, several inches shorter, but Omir's not really a, I can't compare him in terms of physical specimens because Omir's just, you know, built differently. Dude's like a fullback. So, uh, you know, it, like I said, we're interested to see if Omir comes back, you know, maybe they go and get another guy that can kind of rotate in there to the four if they want to do different lineups. 
I imagine they do something like that, especially with the wings on the roster still up in the air if they're going to return. Well, the thing is, and you also want to take the pressure off of Norchad because if he comes back because of foul trouble, you need someone oh, yeah. to suck up some of those fouls because that was a huge issue with Norchad this year. Yeah, no. I mean, when he gets in foul trouble, the team's completely different. You know, you go out, you try and throw a guy like Michael and Wilco out there. I remember when they did that against UNC, and, you know, you just have Armando Baca, who people love to say is 30 on Twitter, just post move scoring on him. Uh, you know, all those big ACC guys, you can't, you know, you throw a guy like in Wilco or AJ Casey at him, you know, they're just lost. And, you know, be able to have that option with Lynn Kidd, you know, hopefully they're both not going to be in foul trouble at the same time. Doesn't seem like that's a problem kids had uh, at Virginia Tech. But, you know, that that provides a big bonus. You know, if you can't have both of them on the floor, you should at least be able to have one of them on the floor. And I don't think Miami is done recruiting at that, uh, you know, big man center position. You know, you lost in Wilco. You still, I mean, assuming Lynn Kidd isn't going to come off the bench. He didn't come to Miami to come off the bench. Right. So whether it is Omir comes back, they still need to get another guy that could play at that side. Because right now, uh, you know, as the roster stands, it's Joe Bay coming off the bench, uh, Swartz, Isaiah Johnson, uh, one of the other uh, freshmen. So who knows? Maybe they go get another freshman, you know, which is something they did later in the process last uh, offseason. Or they go and get a guy that goes, hey, you know, maybe he's got two, three years of eligibility left. Hey, come over to Miami, you know, learn a little bit in our system. And then you kind of get the keys to that starting lineup next year. So interesting storyline to pay attention to. He is Liam Willem- Willerup uh, at the lefty Liam on the on the X um, staff writer from All Hurricanes just does an amazing job covering all the UM sports. But Liam, I'm confused. I so I started to do some research on this Canes basketball team. Who's in? Who's out? Who's coming back? And it, I just feel like they have such a roster in flux. Like they got a bunch of guys who left. They got guys that left that put their name in for the draft. They they could do it without signing an agent and then come back. Mm-hmm. That whole thing. I just, what, what, what do we know? What do we know? Who is on this team right now uh, that we know co- definitely will be there next season? Yeah, no, I'm doing everything I can to talk to everyone. I think last time I came on here, I said I thought Nigel Pack would return. So at least I got that confirmed. I would say that the, the odds of Omir returning are probably pretty high at this moment, given that, you know, you get Pack coming back, a guy that they came into the program together with. I'd say those indications are strong. I'd say it's probably like, 70 80 percent uh don't know if he's going to test the waters again i think Keyshawn george i would be surprised if he doesn't test the waters at least you know makes complete sense for him in a weak draft class year you kind of go over any major draft site they have him at least in some sort of you know first round grade on him so interesting to see otherwise you know wuga poplar i haven't really heard too much of it doesn't seem really positive on that end uh, Matthew Cleveland uh, looks like, you know, I-, I think his time here might be over, uh, you know, still looking that way. I, and that's really about all it gets. I mean, Paul Jobe, I'd imagine he comes back. Is the grass going to be greener for him anywhere else? I don't really think so. You look at the guys who, you know, besides Anthony Walker and Harlan Beverly, the other guys that transferred out didn't really do much at all in their locations, and they're already back in the portal. So I'd imagine that Jobe is going to ha- want to stay because, you know, Miami gave him that chance towards the end of the season. So. Um, I mean, a lot of uncertainty, but I think, you know, in the next couple of days, especially how fast news came out today, uh, we're going to start to have a lot more answers. And uh, I still think Miami, you know, is they're far from done in the portal. I think they got, you know, probably three more guys, uh, if not, you know, also some mixing of some freshmen into that uh, group because there's still plenty of scholarship offers up there. As I was watching Coach L's kind of uh, after season press conference, media, media gathering. He just seems so, like, perplexed. And um, I'm trying to think of the right, like, words to describe his emotions, but I found it really interesting because normally he's really grounded and, and, and he's got all the right answers, and he just seemed bothered. I think bothered might be the word by all of this, like, in and out and up and down. What was your, what was your takeaway? Like, what, what was your thoughts as you're, as you're watching that? Yeah, I think... They went in the last offseason trying to be very careful about who they brought into the program and to make sure that they didn't cause too much disruption because you're going to return. I mean, obviously, you lose your two best players, but you still return, you know, three starters, uh, a solid bench player who ended up playing a lot, starting a lot, and Bensley Joseph. And, you know, that's why they only probably brought in Matthew Cleveland because that's who they viewed as, you know, a guy that could fit in the team. It didn't seem to be that way this year, you know, from all indications. 
Um, and I, I feel like this season did take a toll on Jim Laranega, especially in this whole NIL era, you know, guys that, you know, like, you know, maybe coming off a bench at like a, you know, a max school, like saying like, Hey, I want, you know, X amount of money. And you're like, what is going on? I feel like, th- you know, you're seeing with Leonard Hamilton, you know, same situation. I feel like this year, this season took a lot off of him. And I, I, ex- I wouldn't be surprised especially what happened with Katie Meyer, you know, her sudden retirement uh, last week, the CF, you know, coach L might be kind of working up towards that at the end of the season. Cause he's a hall of fame guy. And I mean, he's good to be around for, you know, his most talented pro- uh, prospect to ever come through the program in Jaleel Bethea. That might just really like, be his last straw. It's like, Hey, I came for this guy, you know, it might be time for me to hang it up. So, you know, thinking about that um, is, there's two ways to look at this situation, right? If you're Jim Laranaga, you could be like, "Hey, I'm I'm excited. I can I want to I want to accept this challenge, right? I got Patea coming in. I want to accept this challenge. I want to see if I can like navigate these waters and, and get this done. This is maybe the toughest time of my career, despite my long career. Just the way the everything has changed, right? On the other hand, you know, it's the this, I mean, this is gonna be way too old for you. This reference, mm-hmm. but Lethal weapon, Danny Glover, I'm too old for this bleep situation mm-hmm. where it's just like, I mean, what am I like? If you're Jim Larry, you're like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. like I, I could be on the golf course. I could be, you know, with my wife. I could be with, you know, with my grandkids. I could be, you know, my sons are involved. Like I could be doing so many other things that uh, don't give me the same amount of stress as this situation. So you can look at it both ways. You know, Katie yeah. Meyer, obviously much younger than than Jim Laranega, but just decided like I don't need to like I don't I'm good. Like I don't need to deal with this. I can live happily ever after with what I've done in my career. Jim Laranega, like I feel like he's teetering. Like he his juices are still flowing, but on the other hand, he's so bothered by what's going on. Do you get the same kind of feeling? Yeah, I mean like obviously he's got passion for the game. I mean, you know, was it long ago where he was in a Final Four or, you know, before that in the Elite Eight season? Like, if that didn't happen, maybe we'd be talking about a whole different story. Maybe, maybe we'd, if there wasn't a Final Four or Elite Eight one, we might be talking about who's the new head coach of the Miami Hurricanes. But, you know, with that still kind of in the back of his mind, you know, it's probably hard for him to say if, you know, he gets back Omir, he, you know, he already got packed back to say, hey, I got two of the best guys from that team. You know, who says we can't run it back again? You know, Aussie, Duke, they're going to be dominant next season. UNC, they're going to be without likely R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott. You know, all their whole teams could be looking completely different. It might be wide open for them to attack the ACC again. Uh, Aussie, like I said, you know, Duke should be the runaway favorites in the conference. But, you know, you don't have to finish number one to make it to the tournament in the ACC. So, you know, you got new guys coming in, SMU, Stanford, Cal, uh, a great opportunity to capitalize. Um like I said, it, it's an interesting situation. You know, might be passing the keys down to someone in the program already or maybe a familiar face. I know, you know, Coach Caputo is an interesting option from people over at George Washington. It's probably going to be a likely candidate, assuming that Jim Laranega, you know, he's not ever going to get fired. Uh, that talk was just ridiculous this offseason. You don't fire your Hall of Fame head coach. It's going to be kind of a mutual splitting thing. It's like the whole thing with John Calipari. Say this, he didn't make the NCAA tournament. He produces talent and he makes that program money. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, when he wants to hang it up, he'll hang it up. But I do think this new era is just taking a toll on him. And, you know, it's not what he's used to, his his time being a coach, this new age recruiting. All right, I'm going to throw something at you. And I think you're prepared for this question, but I don't honestly know. So feel free to give me an <laughs> evil look. All right. Names that you think we might be hearing about out there in the portal that might be, you know, as we're as we're scrolling around the websites, as I'm hitting up the X feeds, and I'm looking at all the names out there, someone or a couple of guys that you know fans should kind of keep their ear to the to the ground about. Yeah, well, I know in terms of a confirmed visit uh, on April first, we're expected to have ECU transfer Brandon Johnson, a guy that I think would be a great fit. Not even even if Omir returns or doesn't return, I think would be a great fit as a guy that can play that three four role, kind of what uh, you know Jordan Miller did. Obviously, not in ter- in terms of just kind of positional versatility, not in terms of skill set. A guy that can shoot the ball a little bit. Uh, interesting one. Uh, I'd also know one of my former colleagues, Luke Cheney, reported uh, Canisius transfer Trey Dinkins is a guy who's interesting. 
Obviously, it might be a different situation now with you know what's going on with Pat coming back, but that doesn't mean Miami thinks, hey, let's we can run three guards and we can have two bigs. That might be a way they're looking towards. Uh, those are two of the names that I'm like rather confident on. There, there's some you know some traction with, and I'm assuming if they gave you know uh, Brendan Johnson a visit, they're not going to rescind it at this point. So you know they might go for more size because you know we've seen that's been a problem over the last couple uh, of seasons. So if they go for that new size. Um, I think those two would be great additions uh, to the team. But, you know, yeah. there's always going to be the hot buzz names. Jamal Mashburn Jr., you know, from Miami. Obviously, his dad, an NBA uh, legend. Uh, you know, that's going to be one that kind of comes around uh, as well. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Johnson kid, uh, he I – li- I like him. I saw him play a little bit. Uh, he, gets some, he gets some rebounds. He's a, he's a tough yeah. dude. That he would does. Be a, I think that he would be a, a bad game. addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they, and they, and they need that. Well, listen, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting few days, few weeks for this program. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing at some point over the next couple of weeks, we'll have to get you back on because it's going to look, it's going to yeah. look different. It's going to look different and we're just going to have to get used to it and figure it out and navigate these, uh, these waters. As I said, Liam, uh, listen, enjoy the time with your family, man. Have a, have an amazing Easter, uh, holiday and, uh, thanks for, uh, scuttling uh, from the airport to to get on here and hop on and join us, man. I appreciate it. Anytime. I appreciate you having me on and uh, to you as well. Yeah, no doubt. Liam Willerup, he uh, does a great job of covering all things Miami for all Hurricanes, part of the Fan Nation Network. You can follow him at the lefty Liam, and I suggest you do so. That'll do it for us on this edition of the Real Ones Canes podcast. Make sure to go subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and make sure to go check out our sponsor, Cut. You can bet on anything. I could I could bet right now on uh, with Liam on cut on an Easter egg hunt <laughs> on how many eggs we're going to get in an Easter egg hunt. That could happen on cut. We could do it and use code Believe Miami. All right, we'll see you next time. I'll see you when I see you. Peace. <laughs>